is very important topic and uh, you might have heard about water cycle right from your school days isn't it that how water evaporates goes up into the atmosphere then clouds are formed because of the condensation then the clouds when they become heavy they they, they can be taken away by the winds from one direction to another direction and when they come down the temperature increases as the clouds come down and then clouds are again converted into maybe rainfall or snowfall any type of precipitation so this is how the god almighty has given us a beautiful water cycle and that is why till date we had been saying that water is a renewable entity but now today if i say that if i ask rather ask that is water a renewable entity so this is very difficult question will you say yes or no so if you ask me i will say no now it is not a renewable entity why the question is that the water has become rather i should say rains have become scanty and the distribution of rain much more important that has become very very irregular you never know when rains will be there if it is rainy time rains are not there and when we don't expect that no this is not the rainy season you you have the rains so we will discuss this uh, one by one in my slides now the question is the water cycle which nature provided us that has been disturbed by us and the major cause of disturbing this water cycle is deforestation everybody knows uh, even um, yesterday the bbc news channel they were showing that the deforestation has been taking place at a large scale not in our own country but at the global level and the situation is worst in india but on the other hand if we ask the forest department they present a very you know a rosy picture no we have this much of area under forest because they count each and every tree even the tree is located in your, in your house also that is also counted towards the forest which actually is not so now you will you will have this point in mind that how deforestation has led to you know disturbed water cycle the reason being that once you remove the trees you know a tree has so many leaves lacks of crores of leaves and uh, the leaves they are already uh, al always transpiring that means water vapor is evaporating out of the leaves and if you count the surface area of the total leaves of a particular tree it may be in hundreds thousands of scales of meter scale area lacks of scale a meter area but if you remove that tree and the canopy of the tree may occupy maybe 10 square meter or maybe 100 square meter area so 100 square meter versus lakhs of square meter area so can you imagine that on one hand if you have a tree the water is evaporating from you know surface area sp uh, spanning over lakhs crores of uh, square meter but without a tree the water will transpire or it will evaporate just from 10 square meter or 100 square meter so that means removal of the forest removal of the forest trees it leads to less evaporation maybe from the soil surface because you know soil is the biggest reservoir of moisture and you know why that uh, you know that we, we are not irrigating the trees we don't irrigate uh, the forest but still the forest uh, the trees they get water of the soil that is the water which is stored during rainy season in the soil so soil acts as a reservoir so the question is when this evaporation has decreased so you never know how the clouds are formed and where the clouds go and then these trees they also control the direction of the wind so when direction of wind is controlled so the clouds their movement that that also changes similarly when you remove the trees most of the rain water which actually should have gone down into the soil that rain water runs over the surface what we call as runoff 
and not only it runs over the surface it goes ultimately into the rivers and joins the oceans and once this water joins the oceans it if no it is no use to us we cannot use ocean water even for irrigation purposes you know it better so not only runoff is there soil erosion is also taking place and you know what soil erosion causes it it uh, changes the course of the rivers because most of the sediments they get deposited in rivers in lakes in oceans even and the best example of sedimentation i should say the famous wooler lake in kashmir that lake disappeared this wooler lake used to be the one of the largest i should not say one of the largest it was the largest lake in asia but now if you go and see the wooler lake it is just pieces of islands so this is man made creation that we destroyed wooler lake because of soil erosion why soil erosion took place because we removed all the you know forest trees from its catchment areas so earlier uh, when forest well maintained forest was there only clear water was coming to the lake but when you removed the forest you know soil erosion took place then so many nutrients coming into the lake sediments coming those sediments they silted up the lake and lake disappeared now it is simply i should say a group of islands and uh, the same is happening with dal lake another famous lake in kashmir world famous lake you go and see eutrophication in dal lake so many weeds growing over there and uh, slowly and slowly water is shrinking and uh, Uh, i should not say but uh, unfortunately a day will come when the day this dull lake will no more be there it will be simply some water stinking water over here and there so this is how this water cycle has been disturbed and as i say because of this disturbance in water cycle there is water scarcity you can see such scenes common and you know in 2016 we had for the first time a train carrying water from one part of the country to another part we named it as latour express so this was this this was the extreme of what scarcity we could observe otherwise people carrying water over their bicycles and tankers and all that those are the common scenes people walking 8 kilometers 10 kilometers women fetching water 10 to 20 kilometers just for drinking purposes in rajasthan and gujarat areas but uh, train carrying water that was one extreme i don't know when again it will happen but you can you can expect it any time now that that was one drought conditions then floods are there you so you so see in 2016 the floods were there drought was also there and 2020 the floods in india you can see the floods in bihar particularly so water everywhere but we no water to drink this is again a situation so both drought and floods they lead to displacement of people and particularly the people living in poor strata of the society they are affected the most they have to leave their houses they don't have water to drink they don't have anything to eat but if i say uh, who is responsible for this creation we are responsible and particularly i should say the elite group of the society means the rich people because always rich people rich uh, mohallas rich cities rich countries they always use a major chunk of natural resources and the poor they have to suffer at the hands of the rich this is a big question mark you think over it because uh, many of you might be rich many of you might be you know medium belonging to middle class maybe some belonging to lower middle class like me and maybe some people might be there who are poor so you have to think that do we have any right to cause such you know humiliation to the lower strata of the society just have a look at the per capita water availability in 1950s we had more than 5000 cubic meters of water per person per annum and now you know this has decreased to in 90s it decreased to 
Then again, 2001, it decreased to 1800. And presently, in 2019, figure is that per capita water availability is now 1420 cubic meters. And you can see the two lines. Uh, one is yellow line, that is water stress line. So we have already crossed water stress line. And now we are approaching water scarcity line. Water scarcity line means when it will be difficult to fulfill the needs of the humanity for drinking water. So I wish that the day may might not come, but this is going to happen. You see, rain distribution in general, this is this is the normal, you know, rainfall distribution from January to December. Unfortunate part is that in this part of particularly the northern part of the country, even the central Indian, uh, you know, central India also, around 75% of the rainfall, annual rainfall, that happens only in two to three months period. And it's very difficult to take care, but it is not impossible to manage this rain, how to handle this rain. So these floods mostly happen because we are not ready. We have not planned the things to manage this rain. And this rain goes out of our hands to the oceans. Not only it goes out of our hands, but it creates a flood-like situation. Every year we have floods here and there in different parts of the country. You know, you, you remember the mudslides in Leh Ladakh. You remember the mudslides in uh, Uttarakhand. 2014 then 2013 that was again a disaster so it is again because we have disturbed the water cycle we have deforested the areas and uh, whenever you know high intensity rains are there soil erosion happens mass movement happens and uh, you have mudslides you have landslides and all that now <clears throat> generally as i said rain for distribution is very important now, what happens that if you have, you do not have during rainy season, if you do not get rain consecutively for 10 days, we say that it is a dry spell. Now, this is very interesting data I, I would like to show you. You see 2012, 15, 16, 2010 and 18. Just have a look at the rain amount, 497 in 12. And then dry spells were 6. Then... In 2015, 611 dry spells were two. But in 2016, again, if you compare 15 and 16, the rainfall is almost same. But in 15, we had two dry spells, means no rain consecutively for 10 days, two, twice. But in 2016, there was no dry spell. Then again, go to 2010, 817, but we had a dry spell. 2018, it was 1,203 rainfall. That means more than normal. But again, we had two dry spells. Now, the question is, having total rainfall more than the average rainfall, I mean, this is around double the average rainfall. But still, you had two dry spells, and we had to give additional amount of irrigation water to our crops. That is 250 millimeter. And here, where, where we had six you know, dry spells, Additional irrigation water was pumped out, and uh, that means 550 millimeter. This water might not have been pumped out if there would not have been any dry spell, like in 2016. So now, what has? If you ask a metrologist, IMD people, they say the rain was more than normal, or they say, okay, we are very happy the rain was normal. But from an agriculture point of view, since dry spells were there, we had to pump out additional water. For us, it was agricultural drought. So this is very important that because rain distribution has been disturbed, you may have good amount of rain on one day. For next 10, 15 days, you don't have any rain. So you have to give irrigation to the crops. Crops cannot wait for the rain. So for agriculture, it is drought. But for meteorological people, they say it's normal. So this is this is very important point which we have to keep in mind. So because of this, you know, if just have a look at the groundwater scenario, because you have to pump out, particularly in Punjab, uh, we are dependent on irrigation to the extent of 78 percent or 77, 78 percent of irrigation water from the groundwaters. 
Now, just have a look at 1973 situation, then 1981 and 1991. I don't see much difference. But after 1991, you see in 2001, you can see the reddish areas. So these reddish area means the water table being uh, going down. So then reddish and still more red areas, you know, the reddishness increasing. So uh, what I want to show is that if uh, you have a look at, you know, 2019 figure, this is the latest and 2009, you see a big difference in the red color. That means during last decade or even last two decades, the water table went down drastically. This is this is quite worrisome figure that despite of, you know, subsoil preservation water act you know, where we, we prohibit the transplanting of paddy before 15th of June, still our water tables are going down at a very fast rate. So that means I don't know why it is happening. Maybe area under rice increasing every year, maybe population increasing. We are yes, population is a bigger factor. You know, if uh, just now I showed you that uh, water availability per capita, it decreased from 5,000 to 1,000. That means it decreased to one fifth. So on the other hand, the population increased by five times. So resources are same. So naturally water availability will decrease and this will be the situation to the water table. Now, just uh, if you have a look over here, this is again very interesting that uh, this is uh, from, you know, some mountainous area of uh, Punjab, that Shivaliks region. You see, this runoff, it happened within five minutes of the start of rainfall. And this is such high velocity runoff that the people cannot cross this. You know, just see the people, they, if they want to cross it, they cannot. But unfortunately, this water is going down the rivers. It will ultimately go to, it will ultimately go to the oceans. Secondly, you see, just after a couple of few seconds, this water will start get muddier. First, the water was clean, and when soil erosion started, this water, you know, uh, this water became muddier. So that means when when it becomes uh, muddy water. It, it contains cell particles that soil erosion has taken place. And you know, Shivalik hills are very fragile region. The soils are very erodible and these the, the sediment losses. We have soil loss, average soil loss to the extent of 80 tons per hectare per year. This is a big figure. And at some places, the soil loss is more than 200 tons per hectare per year. Now you can see the water getting muddier. <clears throat> you can see the cell particles coming out of this water. So this is how we have to manage this water. We have to make a strategy to manage this water. After this, uh, the declining water quality. Water quality is not only water is becoming scarce, but even water quality is also declining. We have brackish groundwater. We have saline groundwater in 42% area in Punjab. This, and fifth, out of this, 54% is high in sodicity. That means that is sodic water. And 22% is high in salinity. 24% is both salinity and sodicity. And this water is not fit for irrigation. But the still people are applying this water. And some people are applying this water in conjunction with canal water. Because they don't have any alternate. Although their soils may also become saline and sodic after some time after they apply this uh, saline water, but uh, then they cannot help it. Then toxic elements are also there, boron, fluoride, selenium. We have selenium in some pockets of Punjab, particularly in uh, district of Sharpur. Then arsenic, uh, this is increasing the groundwater. This is another thing that as our groundwater moves down, the arsenic content also, uh, you know, it increases. Not only arsenic, but uh, the heavy metals, even boron, fluoride. So even uh, the salinity of water also increases. Then if I say that this was the man-made, uh, uh, sorry, it was natural. I mean, now these things are man-made, surface water pressure. You know, the sewerage without treatment going into the rivers. Now you see over here, this is the water coming out from the leather industry. 
and it is joining a nala and you see the color the clear difference that how how dirty and uh, you know uh, viscous this water is it is joining this nala it is uh, then polluting it then again this is a common feature that uh, the sewerage water of the city falling into the nala and you know these nalas are ultimately going to join rivers like satluj river bias river so the question is uh, then the biodiversity in the river that means will be affected and uh, sorry to say these our religious uh, our blind faith in religious that is also adding to the pollution we will have to rethink can we afford this can we afford uh, throwing this these uh, idols uh, painted with chemicals into the waters and can we this uh, throw the puja smegri into our waters because earlier it used to be a ritual because water was plenty population was low okay you used to throw it so i i would suggest that the religious leader they should sit together and because these rituals are also from you know man made god has not said said that okay do this do that so these are man made things they can be changed so it is better that with changing time the times have changed population has increased water has become already dirtier it is scanty men there are many people who cannot afford drinking water even so we have to think about it why not to think and then collectively decide that what to do of these rituals then uh, factories you know every day you every day you have these uh, ppcb means punjab pollution control board they are issuing warnings to the dying units but uh, everything goes on like that dying units say no we are treating our water then uh, dairies in uh, particularly in ludhiana area they are also throwing all the garbage animal residues into these this uh, this is called buda nala ganda nala and uh, you know people say that once it used to be a clear water stream it used to be a rivulet but now uh, if somebody have seen the ganda nala of ludhiana you cannot stand over here for 5 minutes it is such a stinking smell so the question is uh, the factories industry should think about apart from thinking about their profit they should also think about environment we don't have any right to affect the health of our fellow citizens think of it either it is through air pollution or water pollution or due to any type of pollution even noise pollution also so the question is do we have any right that uh, if i am living in a hostel or if i am living in my house and um, uh, i play my recorder on a very high pitch and i don't bother that my neighbor uh, he might be ill he might be getting disturbed by the high pitch of my tape recorder we will have to think if you can think about it you can also think about they do, do have any right to throw this garbage or uh, effluents from the industry or sewerage from my households directly into the nala do they ha have i this right alternates are there but we have to think of it anyhow this these are these are in fact my dear students these are question marks for you because you are the younger generation you can do something about it you will have to think because you have to still live many more years on this earth people like me we have spent our life maybe we are there more, um, not more than 10 years or so but you still have to live on this earth this this becomes your duty to raise a voice against such type of pollution to raise voice against the people who are doing this because government cannot control it is such a huge population you cannot monitor anybody the latest example is delhi government had banned the use of crackers on diwali but then i came to know from one, one of my friends living in fridabad that the crackers they were burst like anything in delhi but government could do nothing and government cannot do anything i assure you because government doesn't have such you know manpower to watch each and every house that who is uh, using the crackers and who is not using the crackers so this is this is you have to think of your own this is your duty this is my duty this is everybody's duty that what we are doing to our environment
you know if if i am living in my house i have three rooms and uh, we clean our rooms every day because we have to live in this room if i say no this is my room i will clean it i don't bother about second room i don't bother about bathroom i don't bother about lawn my wife should do it my son should do it and if they do don't do it then how i can live in this house where only one room is clean so this is our mentality that my house should be clean the rest i don't care but no you have to live, live in that locality particularly now you see people living around buddha nala can you imagine what will be, be their health situation they might be suffering from so many diseases nobody knows nobody has even bothered to carry out a survey that people living near buddha nala what is happening to their health are we are we such you know senseless people that we don't bother to even know about the health of those people but rather we are saying that okay the sewerage from my house should go into the budanala i don't care what happens to budanala i don't care what will happen to satluj river i don't care what will happen to the ground water but the question is remember that if people living near budanala are, are suffering the people living in the entire ludhiana city they also suffer because you know this water is rich in nitrates this water is rich in heavy metals and you know farmers they use this water to grow vegetables because vegetables uh, being rich in nitrate uh, this water it is useful for the vegetables vegetables grow like anything and that those vegetables are supplied to the whole city maybe out of city maybe to the second other district and at the same time when these vegetables grow with this dirty water of budanala the the vegetables also take up those heavy metals and ultimately heavy metals come to your food chain and that becomes you know source of diseases like cancer i should say so think about it that even if you are living far far away from the budanala still you are being affected by this pollution of the water somehow if not by vegetable you say no i'm growing vegetables in my own house i'm not getting the vegetables from the market then uh, you know dairies are there near the budanala and uh, they also the animals eat the fodder from you know fodder grown from the water by budanala and then you take the milk at least the milk from the ludhiana dairies that is supplied to whole of ludhiana and even outside ludhiana so ultimately the things come in your food chain you cannot avoid it you cannot say that i have money and i will did take only bisleri water and that's gone enough no you have to take vegetables you have to take milk you have to take other things so somewhere the you know the effect will be there on your health also so never think that i have money and uh, i will not be affected everybody is affected then village ponds <coughs> village ponds you know if you go to villages of punjab haryana uttar pradesh even in rajasthan rajasthan people have dug their own ponds because they they want water they store water many households have their individual ponds but in punjab also in every village the point at the lowest point there is a pond and whole of the runoff water that accumulates in that pond earlier these ponds used to be a lifeline of the village children used to swim over there the animals were bathed over there even ladies used to wash their clothes but now and uh, you know the water was infiltrating into into the ground this was in fact the recharge point for the ground water recharge and you know every village has at least one many villages have two ponds so if i say 12000 villages in pond at least there will be 20000 18000 20000 ponds in whole of the punjab but now what is happening you can see on the left side this is eutrophication 
again um, sewerage being released into these ponds people throwing this farm yard manure instead of uh, composting it and using it in the fields they are throwing it at the banks of the ponds and when rainfall is there the all of this gets dissolved and finds its way into the pond with the result the surface of the pond bottom and the sides that has been clogged completely with clogging this is the reason that now the ponds never dry up earlier ponds used to get dried up and people used to take out that uh, you know hard silk uh, cloth silt clots those clots were used for me you know making the boundary walls and ladies used to you know plaster the floors of their houses but now we have good development people have money they have pakka houses nobody bothers to desill these ponds so ultimately water never Uh, you know dries up and uh, this is eutrophication you can see this vegetation over here this is eutrophication uh, water rich in nutrients it helps plants to grow then plants they take up dissolved nitrogen from uh, you know this water ultimately the uh, you know flora and fauna particularly fauna fish and other animals are living in this water and you know fish are very much responsible for keeping the water clean so those fish uh, they cannot uh, you know in the absence of oxygen because di dissolved oxygen level goes down and fish cannot uh, breathe so ultimately fish and other fauna they die and once the fish die in the pond you know then there is nothing to clean this pond and this becomes stinking and nowadays these ponds they have become a headache for the people they want that it should get filled up and many people are doing this many villages they are doing this which is against you know your ecological uh, laws we, we this, this is a water body which should have remained there this is a water body which is habitat for many birds this is a water body which is habitat for fish this is a body which is habitat for some type of plants and other microorganisms but uh, we are destroying this and ultimately maybe a time may come you don't have any water body but still we have time we can renovate these village ponds if we know the importance of village ponds then coming to <coughs> this again contamination of surface water you know this is satluj water uh, satluj river this is from roper headwear roper headworks from where the satluj river enters into punjab and you see the uh, this uh, dark green dark green means clean water and as water moves further from zone 1 to zone 2 you know the yellowish starts decreasing and you can see this yellow spot here and yellow spot over here these are the trans boundaries where the ganda nalas meet this ganda nalas or effluents industrial effluents are released into this and in zone 3 you can see the situation this is the worst situation then water enters into you know this is ferozpur husaini wala border it enters into pakistan then again it takes a turn comes back then again goes out into the pakistan into pakistan area and in pakistan we have a leather industry which is called kasoor Kasur uh, is an area in Pakistan famous for leather industry. So, because of the effluents released again into river, this water when it re-enters into Indian, you know, border, it gets uh, still contaminated or contamination level is high. So, uh, we have a contamination of uh, metals like cadmium, nickel, chromium. You know, Ludhiana industry. Uh, electro plating industry is there cadmium chromium they are released uh, effluents are released into the budanala and budanala joins this uh, you know the satluj river and uh, satluj river gets uh, water gets polluted and strangely enough the situation is, has not improved much uh, after the monsoon rains otherwise it should have because in during monsoon uh, there is large flow of water because of the rains because of the water leaks from the dams but uh, you can see the situation still remains grim in grim even after the rains so so this was about uh, the you know water scarcity water pollution now question is what to do how how we can manage how we can uh, correct this water uh, this uh, water cycle so i feel that uh, the strategy should be based on three things one is 
improving the existing water availability whatever water you have maybe surface water ground water you have to improve you have to increase its availability means if you have 100 units of water with you you have to increase it to 200 units maybe 250 units maybe 300 units second point is that uh, whatever water we have let us use judiciously let us not waste water we will discuss points that how to do that and third is manage these resources you have ground water resource which is just like a bank account you are withdrawing you are not putting back whatever you are withdrawing so we have to maintain this bank account similarly surface waters if uh, they are becoming scanty or these are becoming polluted how to manage it so first is how to improve the existing water availability <laughs> so first thing is you have good amount of rainfall so we need to harvest unfortunately till this date we do not have any policy to harvest rain water either at the country level or at any state level in urban areas you know 80 to 90% of rain water it goes as run off water because uh, in every city you know you have uh, made the floors pakka we have come created concrete jungles and whatever rain comes it goes into sewerage system and sewerage they open into nalas nala opens into rivers so whatever rain comes it goes into rivers joins the oceans gone out of your hand so what we can do is first of all we can go for rooftop rain water harvesting everybody need to do this like this one you can store this water in a tank then reuse this water you can even uh, make you know uh, ground water recharge system that instead of uh, throwing this water out rooftop rain water you can let it uh, recharge the ground water technology is already there and this is how the ground water is recharged this is for the community level at uh, at one point in your locality Uh, you can ask the welfare society or you can ask the municipal corporation that they should make these type of water recharge structures so that whole of the storm water goes into this structure and it joins the water table so this is duty of every an individual so you can harvest this rain water for ground water recharge or for storage and once you store it you can reuse it and now particularly in the states uh, you know hilly states like uh, uttarakhand like himachal pradesh mm -hmm. uh, people are provided uh, this type of facility by the government by different agencies to harvest the root of rain water and reuse it for different household goods then uh, you can uh, uh, use it in for non drinking purposes then from no building spaces as i said from uh, you know localities or grounds you can also uh, reach uh, this uh, harvest rain water and let it reach our ground water tip then waste water treatment uh, punjab state has a potential of 2 billion liters per day waste water so if we treat it reuse it at least we can reuse it for irrigation purposes so we don't have till date any policy for that so this is if we are able to harvest the rain water if not 100% at least 70% 60% that will be good amount of water we can store it at individual level we can recharge it to the ground water that is better storage of water and secondly we can treat the waste water and use it for irrigation purposes now another that was in urban areas now in rural areas rural areas also 15 to 20% of rain water goes as runoff so we can go for uh, xc2 type or in situ type xc2 means out of your fields uh, you can uh, you, uh, recharge the ground water by uh, from the village ponds we can uh, you know re uh, revive the village pond like this now this is a pond what we did over here Uh, we were having a project, and uh, we made these two small sedimentation tanks so that whatever sewage water or runoff water it was entering into the pond earlier, we we made the water to enter through these ponds so that suspended sediments and uh, you know lighter sediments and heavy sediments got uh, filtered over here and clear water entered into the pond. 
and then uh, you can deseed the pond so that the recharge capacity of the pond it increases this is one way that uh, these village ponds can help us in harvesting the water rain runoff water and at the same time recharging the groundwater even we can go for dugout type of reservoirs particularly in you know shivalik region or some mountainous track so we can make this duct up type of reservoir line it with a polythene sheet because in those areas we use water we need water for irrigation purposes then we can use this water for drip irrigation and other purposes so this can be done even i should say even in plains people can use four five marla of land uh, for creating such type of reservoir and uh, excess rain water can be stored and then reused later so similarly we have drains in punjab these drains are mostly these drains are now defunct so these need to be renewed and these drains are also helpful not only carrying the excess water out of the fields but also when this water gets recharged into the ground in situ we can use various agronomic and mechanical practices like mulch is very important you can prevent uh, the evaporation losses of water uh, from the atmosphere this will this will help in uh, you know conserving water into the soil now as i said uh, that my thing is my, my point is that whatever one whatever i advocate i do it first of my own this is my house and i constructed this underground tank this looks to be small over here but believe me it is a capacity of 30000 liters uh, of water you know the, these are the pipes coming from the roo rooftop from all the sides from this side from this side and this water is first it enters into a small sedimentation tank whatever the silt or dust or other particles are there they get settled over here and decanted water then enters into this tank then i try to you know uh, save the space also uh, i i mean the roof of the tank it was made around uh, you know one foot about one foot lower than the ground level and then i put the soil over there and it was grassed so even I, uh, I i didn't waste the space also and underground tank is there i fitted it with the you know supply system and uh, one electric motor is there we switch on the motor and we can use this water for lawn irrigation for kitchen garden so i'm i'm very happy that at least um not wasting the drinking water which the municipal corporation is supplying to us i'm not wasting it for washing my car i'm not wasting it for irrigating the lawns or uh, i mean irrigating my kitchen garden so the, it, it may not it may look to be a very simple thing to many people but for me it's a matter of satisfaction and i think that this is my religion that uh, the water which is a gift of life given by our you know um, given by almighty to us and uh, if you have a look at uh, different religious books every religious book maybe guru granth sahib maybe quran sharif maybe gita they they say that water is a really gift of life and this is our duty to preserve it this is our duty to conserve it and use it judiciously and can you think uh, a moment without water number 1 and number 2 everything can be made but water still scientists are not able to you know fabricate water in the labs so this is um, although it is h2o but h2o cannot be fabricated without the help of god so if i can do it everybody can do it if i can uh, spend 50 lakh on my house i can uh, at least uh, spend uh, 1.5 to 2 lakh on this rainwater harvesting and i did it despite of the fact that nobody agreed architect builder nobody agreed to it except this plumber he was a good man he said uh, i will do it for you then this is a common scene if you go to hilly areas they they do it very simple at least anybody can do it you can do it this is not an expensive thing very simple thing uh, you just uh, raise the level of this and already the level of roof rooftop is raised and you can put a pipe over here you can connect it to the reservoir it can be even if it is 1000 liter so whenever rain is there it it will get filled up 
you can they use this water for dam purposes for irrigation uh, i mean non drinking purposes so if somebody says why should i spend 2 lakh so at least you can spend a few hundred rupees on this okay then again a judicious judicious use of water why not to start from our homes first of all this is very bad habit of the ladies that when they enter into the kitchen to wash the utensils just put on the tap and uh, by the time they put on you know detergent the tap is flowing although they don't need it but still tap is flowing this is habit to everybody's habit but please don't do it uh, put off the tap apply the detergent when you are finished with the detergent application then put on the tap and wash the utensils and uh, i have some figures over here i don't know uh, my memory power is in fact very weak but uh, let me tell you that this is uh, it it it's a lot of water you cannot imagine you can calculate the flow of water per minute coming out of this tap multiplied by 5 minutes even if you are uh, you know uh, applying the detergent for 5 minutes during this 5 minutes around uh, 40 50 liters of water has already maybe more 100 liters of water has already gone down the drain similarly shower shower consumes a lot of water so i now you know i i live in the university campus we have 24 hour water supply and it's uh, no dearth of water but still when i go to my bathroom and i bathe just with half a bucket of water just with half a bucket of water believe me because, and i have a small mug instead of bigger mug i have a small mug because i know the importance of water i have suffered because of water scarcity so that's why these are my practical experiences i never wash my car with this pipe and uh, this hose i simply take half a bucket of water take a piece of cloth and wash it manually but uh, this scene is very common nowadays you can get the labor labor uh, the person takes rupees 300 400 per month and daily he will wash your car why to wash your car daily you don't need to wash your car daily but people do it they say no we have given 400 why not do do bhai do do wash it wash it without bothering that how much water one uh, during one car washing you are wasting around 500 liters of water and same can be done just with uh, 15 to 20 liters of water so choice is yours similarly while in this brushing your teeth again we our habit is to keep the tap on then uh, this is again my bathroom and perhaps i have not seen in any bathroom uh, in particularly in homes having a male urinal this is not a common feature people don't uh, think that okay but i have seen that once you go for urination it's only 2 200 250 ml of urine but you flush out that urine with 10 liters minimum 10 liters of water but when you use this male urinal you are doing the job just with maybe half or 1 liter of water so for one urination you are saving 9 10 liters of water just by putting this very convenient also but the question is uh, people may laugh at me but i am very happy that i have done every bit of mine to save water leaking taps very common feature and you know uh, we don't bother about it but if you if you count the drops if you count the water coming out of this tap leaking tap uh, maybe for 24 hours you will be surprised that this is in hundreds of liters and this this somebody sent me this this is this was very interesting thing that okay this is your storage water storage or it could be a pipeline also like you have a tap over here you wash your hands wash your face this is good that instead of going down into the drain they have connected it to the flush tank and uh, they they are flushing this you know this pot with this uh, waste water i was very happy and then i copied it Uh, somebody sent me on facebook this is again my kitchen and you know this pipe it's not that i cannot buy the pipe but the thing is that 
my wife was very angry with me i said no we will keep a tub over here and whenever she washes the utensils this water waste water or dirty water it gets accumulated then uh, only the thing to, i have to do is that additional job on my part that my wife she asked me two to three times per day to throw this water out on the lawn or in the kitchen garden or like that but i do that simply sometimes i get i get annoyed also that okay for two three times i have to get up and pick this huge tub of water and throw it into you know the kitchen garden for irrigation purposes but i do that simply on this pretext that i'm saving water i'm saving water and uh, this is this is how i'm praying to god my prayers are not reciting the part my prayers are doing something to conserve a very lovely gift which god has given to me which nature has given to me so these innovations may be very small looking to be very small but very important then all my uh, students i should say younger uh, brothers what they they are very fond of cold drinks and burgers and this and this and that so you know whenever you process the food it consumes a lot of water you are drinking this you know uh, 250 or 300 ml of cold drink and uh, do you know that uh, it uses 90 liters of water to just create 250 or 300 ml of uh, soft drink even a loaf of bread single loaf of bread consumes 100 liters of water a burger and french fries this small piece uh, french fries it consumes 150 liters of water so more the processing more will be use of water i don't say that don't eat eggs or don't eat processed foods but you can reduce it maybe once a week or something like that so this is indirectly you can save upon water then again industries most of the industries have the equipment which are less water efficient so they need to install the equipment which is more water efficient the machine should be more water efficient but many industries in punjab particularly the dyeing industry they are using old machines which are not water efficient so they are using water like anything in agriculture also i should say because i am talking of domestic i talked of industry in agriculture also for example in punjab we have mainly rice you know rice is water guzzling crop so university recommends that you should not keep water stagnant in rice fields but people don't agree to it they they keep water stagnant for two months for three months so then uh, our recommendation was that keep water stagnant only for 15 days after transplanting thereafter they should go for intermittent irrigation after two days at uh, two days interval but people still didn't agree then we came out with this uh, wonderful equipment called tensiometer and we put this green yellow and uh, red uh, you know tapes over here so we are asked the farmer to advise the farmer to watch the water level in the tensiometric tube when this water level is within green zone no need for irrigation when it enters into the yellow zone they should irrigate and they should never let the water level go into the red zone because then it would affect the, this is the tensiometer it is patented tensiometer very sturdy farmer friendly no need to read or something just see water level and then decide on the irrigation and uh, using this tensiometer you can save about 50% of the water from the farmer practice which he where he keeps water flooded maybe for two months three months so 40 to 50% water can be used by this simple practice but the question is again it is on the part of the farmer he has to daily come to you know to the field and see the water level then decide upon the irrigation he said who will go okay because they have automatic starters on their motors and uh, whenever electricity is there even if they don't need water even if water is stagnant in the field even if rains are there still the water is flowing into the fields that is the pathetic situation that is the most i should say that's a crime i should say it's a sin it's a crime then uh, 
you know, this is very common that whenever rains are there, the cities get flooded up. Why? The reason being this one. The reason being that if this is a, your boundary wall, this is road, we have tried to make this concrete. We concrete, concrete it. You make it pucka structure because we don't want that this soil should be there and this will pollute our house and this and that so this is in fact it should have been a green belt and if you want to make it paka you can beautify it with grass you can beautify it with perforated tiles like this and these these uh, these this is paka as well as infiltration is there Otherwise, if you concretize the things, if you make it a concrete pavement, then infiltration will be zero. Then most of the water, it will get flooded up and because sewerage doesn't have the capacity to carry out this much of rainwater. So till that water flows out, the streets remain flooded up. So this is one way that uh, this looks beautiful as well. But then at the same time, you are making the water to go into the soil. And this is, uh, you know, how to recharge the groundwater from, uh, you know, grounds or localities or parks. Somehow the water after filtration gets into the soil. And lastly, managing the water resources. You can manage surface waters. First thing is surface water, you know, it is coming out in the rivulets, canals, lakes, ponds. The question is, every canal, every lake, every pond, every rivulet has a catchment area. And that catchment area should be well vegetated. It should, it should have vegetation, it should have trees, but we have deforested it, we have removed the vegetation, that's why the sediments come, that's why eutrophication is there, that's why because of the sediments, the capacity of the canals, lakes, uh, or even reservoirs is reduced. So treat the catchment areas so that water infiltrates into the catchment or soil erosion is not there. Clean water, clear water comes into the water bodies. Then untreated wastewater should not go into these courses, should not go into canals or rivulets. And then we can store the excess water into dugout type of reservoirs and reuse it. Similarly, for groundwaters, we need to enhance the infiltration rate of soil because groundwater recharge is very important, which is decreasing nowadays. And then we have to prohibit the infiltration of untreated wastewater. Now, many, uh, I should say, not many, I should say, but some industry people, what they are doing that, they buy some five, six acre of land near their industry and then plant poplar trees over there. And then they, uh, you know, throw that uh, wastewater, untreated wastewater into their land. And they say, this is my land. I'm irrigating my trees. I'm not doing anything uh, harm. I'm not harming anybody. But in fact, they are harming anybody because that the untreated wastewater <coughs> sorry, that goes into the soil and it pollutes the groundwater. So this is very important that we should prohibit this use and at the same time provide green belt in the urban areas. That's very important. Green belts should be there because green belts are recharge points. And then we have to monitor the depth-wise groundwater quality also. That continu continuous monitoring should be there. So a lot needs to be done. So what I feel is that again to manage the groundwater, so you have to plant the trees. So shake hands with plants and these trees should not be planted just because you want to take a picture and because many things happens, okay, tree plantation happened and pictures are there in the newspaper and later on nobody, nobody bothers what happened to those saplings. Then again, small many things, uh, refuse the use of plastics. You go to vegetable market, carry your own bag instead of uh, asking for the plastic bag. Because ultimately these plastics or such type of things, they also find their way into the, you know, water bodies. And maintain biodiversity. This is very important that biodiversity in waters is maintained and the good part of biodiversity is fish. Fish, we keep the water clean. So this is what I wanted to discuss with you. I hope uh, I could justify the thing.